Hello. Welcome to Anxiety Canada's Youth Network Roundtable for Action Anxiety Day. Today marks the second annual Action Anxiety Day, a worldwide awareness day created by Anxiety Canada to destigmatize anxiety and raise funds for anxiety management programs and treatments. I'm the Roundtable moderator, Kathleen, and I work for Anxiety Canada. Today, we'll speak openly about youth anxiety, emphasizing school and workplace anxiety with our Youth Network Ambassadors. Also in attendance, our Scientific Advisory Member and Psychologist, Dr. Marlene Tobeschiff, as well as Mental Health Advocate and Canadian Sports Artist, Dan Peaton. A little background on Anxiety Canada. We are a registered charity and nonprofit devoted to anxiety awareness and support. We develop evidence-based anxiety management resources, including, but not limited to, our award-winning free MindShift CBT app, our helpful online courses like My Anxiety Plan, our online group therapy program, MindShift CBT Groups, and our podcast, Our Anxiety Stories, hosted by John Bateman. You can learn more about us and what we offer on our website, anxietycanada.com. Our youth network is made up of dedicated volunteers who advocate, fundraise, and educate their communities across Canada. And our scientific committee are hand-picked mental health professionals who ensure our programs are effective and evidence-based. You can learn more about our entire team at anxietycanada.com slash r dash team. As mentioned, Dr. Tobeship is a member of the scientific committee. She's been a registered psychologist for over 15 years and works with adolescents and adults. Her clinical work has focused on the delivery of scientifically supported treatments for obsessive compulsive disorders and related disorders, anxiety disorders, and much more. She is the director and founder of Forward Thinking Psychological Services, a multidisciplinary practice serving Ontario and BC. She is our expert today, here to answer our questions about anxiety, and we're so excited to have her here and to learn from her. Our next special guest is Dan Petens, an awesome Canadian sports artist from London, Ontario, known for his highly realistic portraits of professional athletes, including Wayne Gretzky and Sidney Crosby. Dan also donates proceeds from his artwork sales to Anxiety Canada. We are so thankful and so excited to have him here today with us as well. Today, we'll meet virtually from across Canada. I'm in Vancouver and a guest on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I want to acknowledge that we all live and work on unceded territory that Indigenous peoples in Canada have taken care of for centuries. As mentioned, we are zooming in from all over today, and I'd like to introduce you to the rest of our participants. Let's get to the roundtable. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Action Anxiety Day Youth Network Roundtable. First, I wanna thank you so much for being here. Being open and sharing your story helps us destigmatize anxiety and support treatment. And we help other people feel less alone. When we share our story, sharing is caring. So first I will introduce you to our Youth Network Ambassadors, Alita and Caitlin. Caitlin is currently a nursing student at the Toronto Metropolitan University and her goal is to become a mental health nurse. Hi, Caitlin. And Alita is a recent graduate of the University of Toronto, where she studied psychology and was able to express her passion for mental health advocacy through courses, research, and extracurriculars. Thanks for being here, Alita. And as discussed, we have our expert here today, Dr. Marlene Tobeschiff, and member of our scientific advisory committee. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks again for coming. And we have artist Dan Petens, our special guest, who has a very unique career path. So Dan, I wanted to start with you today. You had a very unique career and you had different venues, I know, leading up to your success as an artist. So I'd love to start with you. What's your anxiety story and how did you find Anxiety Canada and become a supporter of us? Sure, and uh, again, thanks for having me here. Um, obviously this is, uh, going towards a great cause and I'm just happy that I can be a part of it. Um, and if at any time anybody wants to jump in throughout my uh, little spiel here, please do. I encourage discussion. 
um, and sometimes I can get a little off topic. Uh, but uh, I remember when I was 11 years old, I had three things. I had a love for drawing. I had the goal of becoming a physiotherapist. And I had this sensation of feeling like I was going down a roller coaster uh, intermittently. And so I'm 11 years old and I know what I want to be when I grow up. And a lot of people called me mature for knowing that. And the only reason I really thought I wanted to be a physiotherapist was because I was into sports a lot and I was injured all the time. So I got the patient look at things and I thought, wow, that is so cool. The way that they can help somebody else and they have this expertise. That's what I wanted to do. That moment, the rest of my life <laughs> up until a certain point was geared towards uh, the goal of becoming a physio. So going through high school, going through my undergraduate degree, getting my master's, every decision I made was geared towards becoming uh, or achieving this profession. And when I got out of physiotherapy school and I was licensed, all I was really left with um, now that I didn't have a goal and um, I wasn't drawing anymore, I was just left with this roller coaster sensation. And I thought that this roller coaster sensation was normal. I thought it was what everybody went through. Um, so I didn't bring it up to anybody because I thought I was just being weak. I thought I was just somebody that couldn't handle it. So why would I speak out about it? I just needed to get over it. I needed to deal with it. Um, and then I thought, you know, once I did get into the profession of physiotherapy, I thought that would all go away, but that didn't happen. It actually got worse to the point where it started affecting my personal life. And it started really making things difficult on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd be calling in work to sick. I would be having a hard time actually performing in my job. But one day I... There aren't any jobs, capsules available. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, and then one day I came home and my wife, who was bearing the brunt a lot of this, you know, I was always coming home, I was confrontational. She said, enough's enough. You got to do something about this. So I thought, let's look for help. The first person I came across was, uh, um, was a psychotherapist. And I went into the appointment and I said, I just want to be happy. Help me be happy so that I can do my job. I've spent six years and a lot of money and resources doing this and becoming this person. Help me get through it. And five minutes into the appointment, she says, you have anxiety. And I instantly became confused. <laughs> I was both relieved, but worried at the same time. I had heard of anxiety before. I knew that a lot of people went through it. And I didn't know much about it. I knew that, um, you know, it was a mental illness and all of a sudden I'm thinking, Oh, I have a mental illness. Oh, can I still do my job? Well, how do, who do I tell? Who don't I tell? Um, and, uh, it, that was sort of the beginning of where I got to finally learn who I was. And I spent a lot of time going to see different psychologists, uh, other psychotherapists, social workers to finally learn who I was and what this anxiety came from. And with that came a change in careers. I tried becoming a, uh, well, I did become a web developer, a web developer, started my own business, um, became incorporated, found out that wasn't for me, ended up working at head office for a big gym company, found out that wasn't for me, ended up earning a job at a local college as a professor teaching, which I really did enjoy. All the while still, in, still having this battle with anxiety, this roller coaster sensation, and then finally, one day, uh, I had enough. I just needed an outlet. I needed to get away from it all. I picked up my pencil. I started drawing again. I hadn't drawn for years, and it felt amazing. My anxiety disappeared for a little while. I got lost in it for eight hours, and it was better than any piece of art I had ever done. And I thought, let's do this again. And again, and again, I started sharing it with people. And people then were asking me to draw things for them, their dogs, their family members. And in the summer of 2020, I had to make a decision. I had a great opportunity, a promotion on the table from the college I was working at, or I was going to go into this unknown world of artistry, which my dad always said, don't become an artist, you're going to starve. <laughs> and I respect that. Um, but my family said, you know what, do what makes you happy. You've been chasing money for a long time. Do what makes you happy. And that's what we did. We jumped in full board into me being an artist. A week later, I finished my first NHL portrait and uh, the NHL asked me if they can share it. And 
that, it, that was sort of the beginning of my career as an artist. Shortly after that, I knew that I wanted to give back in a way because so many people had helped me uh, get through all my tough times. And my social worker, Kayla, I reached out to her after not seeing her for a little while. I graduated from her program and I said, how can I help? She said, there's this great organization called Anxiety Canada. You should check them out. They're really helping raise awareness for people that are going through the kinds of things that you're going through. Uh, I checked it out and I absolutely loved it. And I have been trying to help as best I can ever since. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And we appreciate your help so much. I love your story. It's so interesting. And I love how um, you can synthesize it and talk about it so openly and proudly of just your journey. Um, can anyone else here relate, maybe Alita or Caitlin, to your anxiety sort of informing your path, whether that's through your career or choosing your major in school? Yep, I can jump in. Um, I knew that throughout high school, you know, I was learning a little bit about myself, my interests and figuring my way out, figuring out what I wanted to do in university when I got there. And I remember I people had always come to me for advice when they were going through situations. I remember that very distinctly and I was happy to, you know, be a happy to listen and happy to give any advice that an, a fresh perspective but I realized that I was always neglecting what was going on inside of me I never I never reached out to others and expressed what was what was causing any troubles in my life and it wasn't until I got a little bit older when I realized that this resembles anxiety I've never been diagnosed so I don't want to say that I do have anxiety but it seems to fall within that line um, and that's, in a sense, anxiety was good for me at that time because it did help gear me towards psychology. But I wish that there had definitely been more awareness during that time. I didn't really know much about it. It wasn't not I, I wouldn't say that it wasn't a safe space to talk about anxiety. I just didn't know that that was something that I could have done at that point. Um, but I do remember feeling lost at times and confused and and my mind circling in many different directions, trying to figure out an answer to something that I had blown out of proportion just because my thoughts kept spiraling. So it's been, it was there since the beginning of my, of my higher education, I would say. Um, and studying psychology, I've got to learn more about it. It's definitely been my partner throughout my university journey, I'd say, both in good ways and in bad ways, which I'm sure we'll get into more details about. Um, but yes, that's the kind of generic, more widespread view of how anxiety has followed me throughout my education and career trajectory so far. Yeah. And like Dan was saying, when he found drawing, he was sort of fully immersed in it. Do you feel a similar feeling about psychology, like that it is sort of your calling or it, it helps you understand your anxiety and even lessen it sometimes because it's what you want to be doing? Yes, absolutely. I catch myself psychoanalyzing myself often, um, just trying to better understand my behaviors. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to learn about. Um, I really enjoy it because it's directly aligned with what I hope to do in the future, and I can apply it to my day-to-day -day situations. So that's kind of, I think, listening to Dan's story the a big takeaway that I got from it is that what you choose to do should be something that feels as if it's relieving some anxiety, something that you enjoy and can look forward to every single day. Mine just happens to be intertwined with anxiety because it has to do with psychology. So it's a nice little mix, I would say. But yes, to answer your question, Kathleen, definitely psychology is very interesting to learn about what I may be going through, why I may be going through it, and how it can differ or align with others' experiences as well. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And Caitlin, as a as a nursing student, I know the nursing program is, is grind. It's a grind. I know people who have done it. Um, and it can be anxiety-inducing for anyone. At least I know it would probably cause me anxiety. Um, have you found, like, were you laser-focused on being a nursing student? Did you know what you wanted to do right away? And it kind of been a linear journey for you? 
Um, for me, um, it was actually as someone with anxiety, I always tried to run away from it. It's kind of though like the elephant in the room um, where it's always there. And I never knew I wanted to be in nursing until I actually had the opportunity to work with um, some community health nurses, some mental health nurses. And it was almost like, you know, that elephant in the room was getting louder and that you know, going back to nursing school and learning more about um, kind of my focus, my stream of interest in mental health, um, kind of being able to, like Alita was saying, intertwine both kind of my own personal experiences um, with having that opportunity to help people within the community um, with mental health issues. It's been really special to me and has that, I guess, because of my own experience has given me more of a intrinsic value where I feel fulfilled to be able to um, be privileged to share the space with people who are going through sometimes similar and sometimes different experiences with me. So anxiety, I feel like has always followed me similar to what others have said before. Yeah, wow, and I think it's, it's everyone here is so accomplished and that is such a, an amazing thing. I personally struggle with anxiety a lot when I was in university and I didn't end up finishing my first time around. So seeing the successes and the amazing things that you've all done is, is awesome. You probably don't give yourself enough credit for how amazing you all are. And Dr. Tobeship, I wanted to know, do you have personal like lived experience with anxiety that led you to your career? Do you help so many people in the field? Yeah, it's interesting. I was kind of reflecting on just that idea as people were talking. Um, I can't say that it was like a lived experience specifically that that led me into um, my career path. And I think what's interesting too that we talk about um, when we kind of go through um, that journey, if you will, in terms of becoming uh, more kind of a professional kind of psychologist, therapist, I'm just trying to think of the right words to say this, but is those kind of um, understanding of yourself um, and the lived experience, if you have it, actually kind of stays out of the room um, from a psychologist's perspective. So there are areas of kind of counseling and support, I think of peer support where lived experience is actually um, very important and is a very valued part of the experience. Whereas when it comes to like, as a psychologist, we actually talk about People will talk about some areas of, you know, psychology, um, mental health that they might not um, treat, if you will, and in other individuals because it comes too close to home. So it can actually be quite important to have those kind of boundaries to be able to have that kind of perspective and ability to help others um, in terms of whatever it is that, that they're going through, if that makes sense. So, um, but I do think lots of people get drawn into the field initially for, um, you know, issues that they might be going through themselves, uh, loved ones, um, other things that can draw them in. Um, it wasn't my initial drawing factor. I actually started off um, in a more experimental branch of psychology and then I shifted into um, clinical psychology. So I had a little bit of a different um, journey in terms of getting there. But I think it's something we think about a lot as we go through our field. And you know, the pandemic's been an interesting time for therapists going through um, very similar experiences to everyone kind of in the world, which we've all talked about as being very unique in terms of the anxiety of the world. And we've all kind of experienced it in some way. So how do we help ourselves and remain kind of objecting, objective kind of helping professionals as well? So it's been a very interesting time the last few years in terms of um, I think everyone's had their own experience of anxiety, however that has impacted them. So whether it's longstanding and it's been exacerbated or triggered in different ways or possibly has just emerged from kind of very stressful and different life experiences that people have been going through. Yeah, right. Thank you for sharing that. And it looks like Kaylin has just joined us, I think. Kaylin, are you here? Hello, we have a late addition, Hi. one of our youth network ambassadors and a recent graduate of behavioral neuroscience uh, honors undergrad program at Memorial University, and she will be starting her PhD in clinical psychology at Concordia this fall. 
thank you for joining us, Caitlin. We were just talking about anxiety and how it can shape our career or be a part of our career, career choices, or even our, our major decisions um, when picking a major in school. So I know you just got here, but did you have anything you wanted to share? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm in Newfoundland, so the time zone is weird. <laughs> Um, so I, I actually got an email. I was like, oh no, I thought I had an hour, but I guess, <laughs> I, guess not. Um, Sorry about that. No, no, no. That's totally fun. That's my fault. Um, I mean, I guess for choosing like the career path, I think like going into clinical psychology, like my mental health, I guess, journey um, definitely impacted my decision to go into clinical psychology because, you know, I've had experience in the mental health system and um, you know, like working with clinicians and um, physicians. So I think it really um, motivated me to want to help people like myself, if that makes sense. So yeah, I think it definitely motivated me to go down the clinical psychology path. I just awesome. wanted to say, Kaylin, that that's my alma mater. I went to Concordia for my um for oh, my wow. PhD. Yeah, so I just, oh, that's so awesome. I know that's off topic, but I just wanted to. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's congratulations. Awesome. I'm sure you'll love Thank it. You. It was like absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Again, it all so impressive. You know, I'm trying to think of my impressive things in life. I mean, I was in a Geico commercial when I was like nine. So that's kind of cool, right? <laughs> but I wanted to shift back to Dan and ask you a question about being in the workplace, you've been through a few different career paths or career areas. Um, would you say that there was a stigma around discussing mental health, mental illness in the workplace? Yeah, I think that even though I had my own ideas around that kind of a stigma, I had my own um, own thoughts about what others believed um, somebody with a mental illness would go through specifically anxiety. Anytime I ever talked about it with anyone in the workplace, whether it was a superior or a coworker, um, I was never met with anything negative. Uh, it was always very positive. And so having done that, the first time I did it, when I was in physiotherapy, um, I'd been working for three years and my mentor was across the hall from me. And he was sort of saying, you know what, you've been missing a lot of work lately. And I noticed you're not yourself. Like, are you can you tell me anything? And I kind of came to tears a little bit. And I just said, I have anxiety. Um, this is something that I've been battling for a little while. And I'm not sure if that affects, you know, how you see me as a therapist or how my patients will see me as a therapist. And all he did was hug me. That's all he did. He just gave me a hug and he said, thank you for sharing. And he sat down with me and we just chatted. That's all it was. Um, so any, t any stigma I've ever thought existed, anytime I tried to confront that stigma, I, I was never met with anything that supported it. I'm glad to hear that. That's, that's yeah. really touching. Um, I think a lot of people wouldn't even know if there's a stigma in the workplace around it because they are scared to talk about it. I know for me, like I'm one of the most open people about mental health that I've ever met. <laughs> I've been very at peace with, with what I have and who I am for a long time, but I'll realize sort of almost after the fact that, you know, I'll, I could have worked at a job for two years and never brought it up because I didn't want anyone to see me differently. You know, I, I didn't want to say I have anxiety surrounding this and then have people assume I couldn't deliver in that area. Um, and of course, that sometimes was to my own detriment because when you feel like you're keeping something inside, it can affect you even even worse and it can really get in your in your head. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't know that I would say I've experienced a lot of stigma. But I think a lot of the time I don't even get to the point where I could experience whether or not they have stigma. Um, however, interviewing for Anxiety Canada was a surreal experience because I was asked what my anxiety story is in the interview. And then they still wanted to hire me. And I said sort of everything. So um, working for Anxiety Canada has been really cool because there's definitely no stigma around talking about mental illness. Um, but I wanted to hear if anyone else on the round table has any thoughts on that or has any experiences. Do you think there's a stigma in school or in the workplace? Um, I can go next. Um, thank you for sharing, Kathleen. It's so nice to hear that um, you were able to find a place that um, it's just like, like I said, even for me, Voluntary Anxiety Canada, everyone is so welcoming, supportive. Um, and I think similar to your story, like for me in nursing school, um, 
we feel like this pressure because we're seen as healers and helpers of the community and it feels almost taboo to talk about anxiety um, or mental illness and um, I think that's because we feel that if people found out that we would um, be looked as weak or inferior but I think a lot of the workplaces I've been at, there's a lot of great resources at the university I go to. And I think too, that's important. It's almost like, I think the analogy of um, when you're in the plane and the oxygen masks come and in order to help others, you have to help yourself first. Um, so I think a lot of it is what I perceive the environment to be, but you're right. I think there are, people are more open, starting to be more open. There's more conversations about it and less, um, I guess, more space to talk about and less judgment around it. Alida or Kaylin, do you experience anything in like a school setting? Does anyone ever talk about their anxiety openly in the school space? Or is it something that is sort of kind of off to the side? People know it's happening and people are struggling, but they're not really talking about it. I think um, through my undergraduate experience, there's definitely been an increase in mental health advocacy. I notice um, several newsletters and emails that I've received over the years highlighting all of the resources that are available, whether at my particular college at my university or more um, even resources outside, the, outside of the university, which is which is very nice. I know that it, this wasn't the case, for instance, when my sibling was in school at the time. I don't remember her ever bringing this up or talking about it with me, at least. Um, and I feel that the more, the smaller circles that you join, such as volunteering at a lab or joining a club, they get even more specific about checking in with you. For example, I know that um, the PhD student that I work under She's checked in on me several times, asked about my mental health, how I'm feeling, if there's anything she can do. So that's very, it, it's nice. I've, I've never felt alone, I suppose. And even when I'm not thinking about any anxiety that I'm feeling or any, any difficulties that my mental health um, has experienced due to school, there's people that check in on me and help keep me grounded and put into perspective what I have been experiencing since the last time that I've thought about it. So it's nice, there's, I, there's definitely been a, a growth in advocacy that I've noticed the past, I guess I could speak on the past four years that I've been in university, which is very nice to see. Um, yes, I think it's a very big help, especially now during, I, I can't even imagine the students that started university during the pandemic. I'm sure that they experience a different type of anxiety that I was, um, that I wasn't, thankfully that I wasn't ex exposed to. So I'm, yes, I'm very, I feel that there's a, a positive direction, positive trajectory that schools are taking towards mental health. That's great. And Kaylin, did you have anything to add on that? It's okay if not. No, yeah, I think I 100% agree with Alita. I think um, just throughout my undergrad experience, there's definitely been more advocacy, especially like just in, in my university. I think my university actually does a very good job of, um, I guess, like making students aware of different resources. And um, like we have, I'm sure other universities have this as well, but we have like a counseling or like a clinic on campus. Um, and just like thinking back to like grade school, like middle school and high school, I feel like like with my own struggles with anxiety, I feel like teachers and guidance counselors, they always were there and they wanted to help, but it was almost not, it wasn't like taught, I guess, like how to help like maybe a kid struggling with the mental health or how to recognize that even. Um, and I guess that was sort of my experience. So it's like they wanted to help, but they almost didn't know how. Um, but I definitely agree with Lita. I think like in the past couple of years, I think it's like we've seen tremendous growth in like educating and um, advocacy and destigmatization of mental health. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear. Especially I went to school. Um, I started university in 2009. So 
kind of recently, but um, it already sounds like things are changing a lot from when I was there. I did feel lots of support and there were lots of resources, but I did within a school space sometimes encounter stigma that was, it threw me off guard because again, I've been very open about mental health for a long time, but I had a professor tell me that my generation invented these labels and that none of us should worry about them. Uh, when I opened up to him about having anxiety, um, I had a, a um, peer say that anxiety is just another word for weakness. When I said, yeah, I deal with anxiety sometimes, like kind of saying it on the side, like it's no big deal. Like I'm still cool though. I just like have anxiety. And, um, and he said, yeah, that's just another word for weakness. <laughs> So not to say that those couple experiences were the way things were when I was in school, because there were lots of great attitudes, lots of support and resources, but I'm really happy to hear that you don't have any stories like that. <laughs> that makes me really happy. Did anyone else have anything to add before I move on to our next question? I guess I did just want to echo um, what uh, Kaylin and Alita were saying in terms of the changes that have happened. I treat um, a lot of like adolescents. So seeing like them talk about different supports that are often really mostly impressed, if you will. Like there's usually, you know, a quiet room um, that teens can go to, or mindfulness is something that's brought into schools now. And I think back to when I was going to school, um, those definitely were not kind of offerings that we had at that time. So I agree, not everyone has the skills or the language um, or the awareness <laughs> to be able to offer what needs to be offered. But I think the overall trend is definitely in the right direction. And, you know, I remember, you know, when I was at school and kids that had like, um, like ADHD would be put out in a desk out in the hallway. Like that's how, mm -hmm. or, or borders would be put up around their learning, thankfully. Thank goodness, those things don't happen and the approach is very different. I'm not saying they get it right all the time, but the overall trend is definitely in the right direction. And the more um, like places like, you know, organizations like Anxiety Canada exist, right? The more we're able to um, allow the world to understand what it is that people are experiencing. So I think that work is just so important. That's wonderfully said. I love that. Thank you, Dr. Tobeschiff. Our next question is, does anxiety ever help you in your personal life? For example, does being a perfectionist make your work perfect? And I will start with Dan, because I know you said that you don't have anxiety really when you do your work. You're so immersed in it and you love it. But do you feel like there is sort of a, a current of anxiety pushing you forward and through your work? Yeah, I think so. I, I think I, I learned how to use my anxiety from a really young age, actually, um, when it came time to preparing for tests or exams or doing any kind of an art project or something like that, I would always try to overachieve on it. Um, and that overachievement and trying to do better and beyond kind of carried over into a standard that I set for myself. And trying to live up to that standard consistently is um, sort of where a lot of my anxiety came from, or the thoughts of what if this is not good enough? And that thought press process and, and leading to all the negative thoughts that went along with it, um, you know, that, that was unhealthy for me at that moment. But coming into art, I found that I could work on my perfectionism as I'm doing it, because obviously in the, in the medium that I choose or specifically uh, the, the style that I do photorealism, you do want to have a certain level of perfectionism because if, if I end up, you know, googly eyesing some guy's eyes, it's, it's going to be very apparent. Um, but at the same time, if there's something that isn't perfect in my drawing, I take the time to look at it and say, does it need to be changed? And even if I can change it, even if I can go in there and it's just a matter of a couple of pencil strokes or a little bit of erasing, I ask myself, does it need to be changed? And if it doesn't, and the value is still there, then a lot of the times I'll leave it. I'll release my drawing and nobody will say anything about that one little mistake. And in that way, it becomes um, uh, therapeutic for me to just to prove to myself that perfectionism does not mean, uh, or, or non-perfectionism does not mean no value. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And your work is so cool. So it's really like awesome to have this sort of perspective on what goes on behind the scenes and thank you. and how long it takes. Did you say, it does it always take like eight hours for one drawing or longer? Well, you know, I'm always trying to, <laughs> I'm always trying to improve. Right, but not necessarily in the little errors, but I'm always just trying to uh, push my technique a little bit further. So originally it started out as eight hours, but my latest piece just took 76. So um, each one I'm trying to just see where, where else I can go with the medium. Awesome. Does anyone else feel like they encounter anxiety in a helpful way, whether that's in work or in life, whether it pushes them forward or their perfectionism helps them achieve things? I can jump on this. Um, Thank you, yeah. I've definitely learned my learning style throughout university and how anxiety touches on that. I've noticed that there's a nice a sweet middle spot where I can get a lot of work done effectively and efficiently. Uh, whereas if I start too early, I have no motivation. I don't have anxiety, a little bit of anxiety to keep me alert and push me towards what I need to do. Whereas if I wait way too long, I'm in such a high state of anxiety that I can't think clearly and focus. And I've noticed that this is applied to things beyond um, beyond just my, my school. For instance, even getting somebody a gift. If I think way too far, way too ahead of time, I can't possibly think of what gift to get them. If I wait way too close to the birthday or whatever occasion it may be, I'm very stressed about what it will be. So I, I noticed that anxiety is kind of the, one of the motivations behind finding that sweet middle spot that's applicable in my education and in my everyday activities too. I don't know why gift giving was the first thing that came to my mind, but <laughs> I have anxiety with gift giving too. And it's, it gets a lot sometimes. It probably means your gifts are amazing. So they're very well thought out and I, I can relate to that. that. I think, yes. I <laughs> have like a notes, a note in my phone of what my friends like. So. Yeah. Yeah. You listen to something like you write it down and then you surprise them. Yeah. That's an amazing quality to have. So that is a good thing. Caitlin, can you relate to that? Um, yeah, I think for me, it is about, um, I guess, reflecting on my own experiences that um, you never know what someone's going through. And I feel like a lot of times, too, people who struggle with anxiety are really good at hiding it. Um, so I think it's my own experiences have made me more empathetic, more patient, more understanding and just open minded, because, again, you never know what people are experiencing behind closed doors. Totally. Yeah, I, I feel like I would never trade the experience of having anxiety because it's opened up my capacity for empathy so much. I would, I would never want to live without that. Kaylin, can you relate to that? Yeah, definitely. I think um, sort of relating to what Dan said, like using my anxiety to sort of push myself, um, like using anxiety in the right way, like not allowing it to sort of like hinder what I want to get done um and allowing it to like motivate me to complete schoolwork or get tasks done um I was just thinking one thing that I do that I need to work on with in regards to perfectionism is like I'll submit an assignment for example and I'll go back and I'll just reread it so many times looking for mistakes and I think that's one thing like especially with perfectionism is you can't do that um yeah, so that's one thing I can work on um, in respect to sort of, yeah, I guess perfectionism. But yeah, I can definitely relate to Dan, like using my anxiety to, in the right way to motivate me to get stuff done. Right. I can see Dr. Tobeshift nodding. And I think that's why it's great to have an expert here as well, because you, when you're saying you read things over and over, I'm like, oh, that's bad. I do that all the time. But I see, I saw you nodding. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think everyone like said it so nicely in that anxiety is like any other emotion that we actually have to have and have to experience. So, you know, I always say to people that I'm working with, like no one ever comes to see me and says like, I want to get rid of happiness, you know? And in that way, it's the exact same thing. We don't want excessiveness in terms of our anxiety, but we actually need it. And the way... Um, Alita described it was beautiful and the idea that there is a sweet spot to anxiety and it's like actually 
you know, from a kind of physiological perspective and what we know from research, there absolutely is kind of like a U-shaped curve to anxiety in the sense that when we have too much, it really pushes us over the edge and we're not really functioning in the way we want to. Um, I think I was nodding um, when Kaylin said that because I was thinking about it from like a graduate student perspective and I was like, no, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't do that. Um, it's like the postmortem of like my essay handing in and reviewing it all. Um, but, you know, in certain, I think, you know, career, all career paths, really people are so driven, right? Um, and can be so driven to perform and excel. Um, and probably we all have that in our own way. Um, and certainly I can relate to that from my, um, from my graduate school days in particular, when there was such a drive to excel. And I would argue that I had more time than if you will, to sometimes focus on things. Um, I think, you know, Dan's framed it like, I'll actually stop myself from changing something, which I think of as a fabulous exposure to doing something not like 100% kind of perfectly and how I was forced to live my life more that way as I got older and had kids and kind of other responsibilities filter in that there's only a certain amount of time that you can devote to certain things, right? So, but we absolutely have to have anxiety. It protects us from danger. There are times it kind of keeps us on our toes in terms of being vigilant around our environment. Um, and when I think about it from a therapeutic perspective, we don't work to get rid of anxiety. We work towards having a different relationship with our anxiety, right? So that's what I think is very important. Um, but everyone answered that, um, I think, in such a nice way with their own experiences. So, yeah. I agree. Yes, thanks everyone so much for sharing everything that you shared. I have one last question before we go to our Q&A with Dr. Tobeshif. And we'll have questions that we've compiled from Instagram and our team, as well as there is time for you to ask questions if you think of any. Uh, some of them could have sort of been covered by what we've been talking about, but it'll be good to recap. My last question is for anyone who wants to answer it is what would you tell your younger self about anxiety? Um, I can jump in first. Um, the one thing I would want to tell my younger self is, um, first of all, what anxiety is, because I didn't know what it was, but that it's okay. It's, it's okay to have it um, because in experiencing that sensation that I just, that I called the roller coaster sensation. Again, I just thought I was weak. And then as I tried these different careers and wasn't able to achieve them, or just even backing up into elementary school when I was constantly experiencing it, and sometimes wasn't even able to go to elementary school because I was so physically sick. Um, I just felt weak and I felt like a failure. And I think that thought process was a lot more damaging than the anxiety itself. And I wish I could just go back in time and, and just tell myself, if you have anxiety and it is okay. Other people experience it. I love first, that. Sorry. The first thing that came to my mind was also to tell my younger self, it's okay. <laughs> that it's normal. Definitely. That's the first thing that came to my mind. I wish I also would have, a, I wish my younger self knew more about what anxiety was. And if I did, then maybe I would have recognized anxiety in my life in, the, in a positive aspect first, rather than a negative aspect. Um, I think a lot of people, including myself, the first time that I identified anxiety in my life was through something that caused me stress and made me worried. Um, so it's easy to have that kind of tunnel vision that anxiety is, is something bad, but you know, more awareness, which is the goal of Anxiety Canada, hopefully over time that'll kind of shift how many people come to know of anxiety and thus how they how they continue to view anxiety over time. I can jump in. Um, I think, yeah, the, like Dan and Alita said, the first thing I would tell myself is what anxiety is, um, what intrusive thoughts were, because I feel like those are, like intrusive thoughts is what I sort of struggle with the most. And I think they're so, they're, no one knows what they are. Um, yeah, so I think I'd educate myself or tell myself what those are and that they're normal. Um, and then I think I would also tell myself that you're not alone because I feel like when I was going through like a really rough period, I felt so alone and that I was like the only person that was ever experiencing what I was experiencing. Um, 
and it's very alienating and I think it just sort of like exasperated the anxiety that I was already experiencing so yeah I guess just telling myself that I'm that what anxiety is and then that I'm not alone not the only one experiencing it I think for me echoing everyone's sentiments too and adding I think I would um, self-validate myself um, and have this piece about self-acceptance that it's okay I am um, you know not any no one's perfect and I definitely I think I would go back in time and teach myself uh, coping strategies and mindfulness <laughs> practices I wish I had that back then because they are so helpful now definitely Yes. Yeah. And I have, I have friends who are teachers that even before I worked at Anxiety Canada said they use our resources with their students and their students know what anxiety is. And I'm so glad, Dan, you answered with that and everyone echoed that you wish you just knew what it was. You would tell yourself what it was because um, I, yeah, when I asked this question, I was like, oh, I don't know what I would say to that, but I didn't know what anxiety was. I had a nightmare one night, the word anxiety popped up. I Googled it when I was younger and I just like knew I had it and had to advocate for myself um, to get that diagnosed because no one around me knew what it was either. So their responses were, you know, confused and, and um, unsupportive as a result because they just didn't know what it was at all. Um, so they didn't know how to support. So absolutely. I wish we could all go back in time and tell ourselves what anxiety is and if Anxiety Canada resources, print them out, give them to our younger selves, give our younger selves a hug. Well, thank you everyone for everything you've shared so far and being vulnerable and open. We're gonna start the Q&A now with Dr. Tobeshift. So our first question that came up a few times uh, from Instagram submissions and other venues is uh, we kind of already touched on it, but do we need anxiety in our lives and how is it a good thing? Right. So yes, absolutely. As we kind of touched on that idea of we, we do need anxiety for sure. Um, and the goal of treatment would never be to get rid of the experience of anxiety. Um, you know, I always say to people, nobody likes to experience anxiety. And I include myself in that um, situation, which I talk to people about. Um, but it is about kind of changing our relationship to anxiety and often changing our interpretation of anxiety and how we experience it. Um, and there's a lot of you know, education that we do when, when we work with individuals. So um, you know, my orientation really comes from like a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective is a huge part of my orientation. And I use a lot of acceptance and commitment therapy work as well. Um, but you know, in that there's a lot of education around what anxiety is, um, which I think speaks to what everyone was saying in terms of the importance of knowing what it is, um, knowing, you know, the kind of, I hate the word normalcy, so I'll kind of use it in quotes, but the normalcy of intrusive thoughts, which is really important for people to understand when they experience that. Um, and knowing that, why do we need anxiety? We need it to avoid danger. We need it to be aware of our surroundings. It can be motivating. Um, you know, having that sweet spot of anxiety before a test or an assignment motivates us to get the work done. Having too much can kind of shut the process down. And when we talk about perfectionism, there's kind of that um, extreme perfectionism, which can just turn into um, extenuated procrastination, right? Where people won't work at all. So you're kind of you're wanting to kind of balance it out. Um, and, you know, mo it's really that idea of like having it so that it's motivating, but not having too much of it so that it's really shutting things down. Um, so I do see it as a good thing, if you will, when it's not excessive. And I think what's really important when people are working on their anxiety, even either in a self-directed way or with a professional, is to come to kind of embrace, if you will, um, and move into their anxiety. So suppressing it and pushing away um, gives it a lot more power um, and is definitely not what we want to do when it comes to anxiety. Definitely. Yeah. And I definitely relate to that because I do feel like using coping tools makes it so that I'm so thankful for my anxiety and not mm -hmm. keeping my anxiety in check means I'm not thinking in that perspective where it's, you know, this friend of mine, now it's my enemy. So. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The next question is if you are diagnosed with GAD, so generalized anxiety disorder mm -hmm. or another anxiety disorder, 
does that mean that you have that disorder forever? Hmm. I mean, it's a great question and it's something that people think about and ask all the time. Um, you know, definitely some anxiety um, disorders have a chronic nature to them. Um, my area of specialty, if you will, I, I work with a lot of individuals that have obsessive compulsive disorder and GAD, some will argue it, it sort of has a lot of overlap and kind of there's just minimal distinctions between them at times. Um, but all that to say that that chronic nature we can expect with some anxiety disorders to wax and wane. Um, you know, someone might have a very discreet uh, phobia of spiders, that might be something that we could target in six or eight sessions. And it might be something that someone would overcome and just kind of move forward in a different way. But I think when we're talking about some of the other anxiety, we do want to think about them as how they can wax and wane. But that doesn't mean that it has to interfere with your life forever. Um, so I often think about how do we learn to live with, you know, chronic health conditions, as an example, and anxiety is no different in a sense. So um, I have asthma as, a, as an example, um, pretty severe <laughs> asthma, to be frank, I've been hospitalized with it and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's up there on the um, you know severe end of the spectrum, but there's obviously modifications that I need to do to be able to stay healthy, which can involve for me lifelong medication, um, you know exercise, you know things I do around my house in terms of dust mite proofing and all those kinds of boring things. Um, but it's that idea that there's things that we do and we might even do on a daily basis with respect to our anxiety um, that we do to kind of stay in that zone of wellness, right? Which can be, you know, exposure um, in terms of exposing ourselves to things that we might not want to avoid or that we don't feel necessarily um, comfortable doing. It's kind of staying on top of our anxiety, if you will, um, or knowing that at times we're kind of taking our anxiety along with us for the ride, right? So mm -hmm. it's really that we can live with anxiety and it doesn't have to control everything and it doesn't have to be something that we feel um, is going to take away our quality of life. You know, if we kind of use an analogy, our anxiety can kind of ride in the back seat of our kind of life car, and we can be really in the driver's seat kind of calling the shots, right? And I think that can be a, a shift in perspective that people have, um, not to say that it's not really difficult to be given that diagnosis or to realize that this is something that I might have to kind of manage in a different way, possibly for many years to come, um, but that it is manageable and that there are treatments and ways that we can live with it and have a very good quality of life. And I think that part's really important. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful yeah. to know. And there was yeah. sort of a follow-up question to that on Instagram is if I'm on medication for anxiety, does mm -hmm. that mean I will be on it forever? Yeah, so that is a great question. A little bit outside my scope as a psychologist, mm -hmm. which I always mm -hmm. preface. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly in my career, although I, I am in my private practice now, up until now, I've always worked in um, hospital settings within Ontario. Um, having the fortune to work closely with psychiatrists. Um, so really seeing the positive impact that medication can have and how it can open the door for people to engage in therapy, um, sometimes to allow some of those, I think of like anxiety can have very like sticky thoughts um, to allow those thoughts to become a little less sticky, to give them, make them a little more kind of pliable. Um, so, you know, I like to work with people to think about medication Again, not as something that's negative if you do need it. Um, if you do need it, there's probably a reason and it's a good conversation to have with whoever the prescribing physician is. Um, sometimes people need it lifelong for maintenance of wellness. Uh, sometimes people will titrate off of it. Um, it's interesting though, right? When we uh, compare, and I think it goes back to your stigma question. When we compare um, like a mental health issue with a, a chronic a physical health issue, if you will, people don't often think about it the same way. Like, as I mentioned with my own asthma, it's not even an option to come off my medication. Like I would, that, that would just finish me off, right? <laughs> um, but it's interesting that people will think I should do this without medication, you know, and sometimes you can. So I'm not saying that that's not a good thing to try. Um, 
but sometimes it's very helpful to be able to use medication as well alongside therapy, alongside other self-directed work. So um, I think it, as part of the whole kind of stigma that mental health can have, um, medications for mental health issues sometimes do bring their own stigma that we don't always see for you know diabetes, asthma, heart conditions. It's just, oh, I have to do this, so I, so I will, um, which I think can be unfortunate. So those conversations with your physicians are very important, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so yeah. important to know. Before I end, uh, ask the last couple of questions, I want to ask yeah. the rest of our panel, do any of you have a question for Dr. Tobeship? I actually do. Um, yeah. With everything going on, the, like going on in the world with the pandemic, racism, mm -hmm. police brutality, I know a lot of young people like myself are experiencing a lot of anxiety, just seeing how everything's unfolding right in front of our faces in the world. So do you have any advice to give to people who are feeling overwhelmed, who are feeling really stressed and anxious about all these things happening around us? Yeah, that is a fantastic question um, that I will try my best to answer. I think there has been a tremendous time of uncertainty in the world. Um, and it's been a lot that I've reflected on too, because when we work with anxiety, we often think about tolerating uncertainty, but the uncertainty that the world has provided to us in the last, you know, going on three years soon is like nothing we've all ever really had to experience before. And there's almost like the day-to-day -day that I need to carry out where at times the backdrop of the world just felt distracting. Um, and I remember talking to colleagues about it and being like, it's even hard sometimes just to focus on almost like the minutia, if you will, of what we're talking about, which was not minutia, it was important things. But when, you know, there's a war going on right now or, there was, there always has been racism, but things have blown up over the last few years and some of the just really kind of violent um, and understandable outbursts that we've seen. Like, how do we just kind of focus on the day to day when all that is happening? And I don't have, I don't have a magic answer for sure. Um, I do think social support networks play like a very significant role. And when there were, you know, lockdowns and it was hard to connect, I spoke to a lot of people about connecting any way you can, you know, whether that's like virtually text messaging, you know, the feelings of isolation, I think also really magnified um, kind of the, the uncertainty that was going on. And for some people that were alone, which, you know, if you're in your kind of 20s, early 30s, you might be alone, like that's a very normal time in your life to be living alone, be at school, not necessarily be living with family. And then you're kind of locked down and you're all alone. So those connections, however you could do them, however they were safe. Um, Anxiety Canada did post fantastic resources during that time, which I think was great. Um, reaching out and being able to access kind of mental health services wherever you are, I think is also important. Um, I don't know. I think there was like, you know, a thought of, not like this, there, it's not a this too shall pass because I don't, I don't really, that's kind of a little bit, not that helpful, I think, but I think the hope was that things would kind of settle at some point, if that makes sense. But I know it felt like there were kind of hits that cut, sort of kept coming over and over over the last few years. Um, and I think for all of us, it was sort of recognizing that we don't really know what tomorrow might bring and how do we kind of cope with that? And I think that's been a very large scale learning experience, if you will, for the whole world. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer for that one though. Um, but I mean, I know you mentioned mindfulness, which I was, um, I always think about too, because it's not like a relaxation strategy, as you know, it's really that idea of how do I accept this moment for what it is, for whatever it brings me. And even those small bouts of mindfulness, I'm not a one hour kind of meditator, but even if you take those two minutes or three minutes and try to kind of use your breath and ground yourself in this moment, you know, this particular moment in time, um, sometimes those things were helpful, I think. I found physical exercise very helpful. Um, during that time, kind of getting fresh air, getting out for a walk, going running, you know, anything we could do 
I think that would allow us to have some sort of small sense of normalcy, despite the fact that there was a, a really significant backdrop of tension. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but, and also to validate how difficult that was and has been um, without like the clearest end in sight, although things definitely looking much better than they were, we were speaking a year ago for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, it's a great question um, and one that comes up a lot in the work I do or, you know, some people feeling um, kind of having core beliefs around um, not always trusting people um, or not always believing in, you know, systems and systems that are at play. And I think there's been, you know, messaging that people didn't always believe in over the last few years or being disappointed by family or friends given things that have happened and unfortunately adds to their evidence that I don't know if I can trust people. I don't know if I can trust anyone but myself and nothing to do sometimes but validate the very real feelings I think that people are experiencing at these times as well. Sometimes they'd be like, yeah, I totally know <laughs> how you're feeling. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that it's been a, a really tough time in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I. I definitely think that's important. It's validating, even when sometimes we don't know what to say, just validating that on a global scale, there's a lot of hard things going on right now. Yeah, yeah, and thank you for that question. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Caitlin. And that's, it definitely brought anxiety to the forefront, a lot of these issues. I think it's all so interconnected with anxiety, um, which brings me to our next question about coping tools. Mm, yeah. Um, and so what are some coping tools we can use in the professional or educational setting or anything we could use it for when the world around us is a very stressful place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm happy to highlight some kind of a few um, kind of tried and true kind of coping strategies that I like to think about um, when working with people. Education is something and we all spoke about that today and like is education a coping tool and it actually is. I mean, psychoeducation is a huge part of cognitive behavioral therapy and knowing is powerful. Um, and it's really important for people to understand um, what they're experiencing, what their symptoms are, kind of how it all maps out in terms of their kind of thoughts, feelings, um, behaviors. So to me, like education and information is powerful and important. Um, we talked a little bit, or I guess I mentioned a little bit here, idea the idea of exposure and exposure therapy, but exposure even in an everyday sense is really when we face things that we would um, otherwise kind of fear um, and not necessarily want to face. I, I see Alita has her hand up though. Do, yes. I'm I happy to take a question instead of me just chattering. <laughs> chattering I just on. didn't want to interrupt, so I figured. No, 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 it's totally good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on the first point that you spoke of, of yeah. educating yourself. I wanted to ask whether there is, um, I know that Anxiety Canada, of course, specifically targets anxiety, but to reach out for resources beyond Anxiety Canada for more educational purposes, do you find that there is a certain website or a certain a publisher that is best to reach out not to to seek uh, resources mm. because yeah. I know that when when I you know the the loophole you get into when you think you have some type of illness and then you go on a google search and you read a lot of misinformation yes. and your mind just spirals it's, it's something that obviously should be avoided especially with mental health um yes instances. you don't want to go down the rabbit hole right so I mean, for me, other than Anxiety Canada, because of the work I do on OCD, the IOCDF Foundation is a solid source of information for um, OCD. Um, there's a bfrb.org uh, resource, which I turned to for uh, body-focused repetitive behaviors. Um, those are some really big ones for me. Probably if I thought about it a little longer, I would think of some other things. But those are big ones that I that I like to go to a lot. Um, I was thinking of the Canadian Association for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, but I don't know if they have as much in terms of resources for um, individuals versus resources for professionals. Um, I was just at their conference last week, which was excellent. So, you know, those are some really nice um, resources that I turn to in the work that I do quite a bit. 
Um, but I agree, like, and many people, we almost have too information, too much information at our fingertips at times, right? Um, in terms of kind of going down um, the rabbit hole with that. But it's a good question um, in terms of where can I go for some resources that are helpful? Yeah, yeah. Um, was that helpful, Alita, just to talk? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So, yeah. So, I mean, going back to that idea of kind of coping tools, you know, that idea of kind of challenge, I think of even like a small scale, like kind of challenging ourselves even on a kind of daily or weekly basis and doing things that we don't necessarily want to do. I think for all of us at times um, kind of keeps us on our toes in terms of like staying on top of avoidance and staying on top of things that might scare us and understandably so. Um, I remember when I went for my second um, vaccination, I was still pretty isolated at uh, respiratory um, issues and how little we knew about the pandemic at times. And I went to one of those big <laughs> vaccination clinics and walking in there and I was like, okay, this is aligned with my value system. This is a good exposure. I'm heading in <laughs> and whatever happens, I got to do this. So kind of that idea that how do we push ourselves at times that we might feel like extremely uncomfortable. Um, some other things that I think about, we've spoken about mindfulness, or sometimes I talk about it um, as like present moment awareness, just kind of being more aware of what's happening in the present moment can actually be a really good coping strategy. It doesn't necessarily make the present moment better, if you will, um, but it does allow us to just be present with what's happening without judgment um, without labeling and without necessarily negativity, if you will. And it can be something very helpful in terms of allowing us to stay grounded and stay aware. And then, you know, those are some kind of more behavioral pieces too. And we can think about where do our thoughts kind of fit in, right? So kind of reframing or challenging um, anxious thoughts that we have when we're stuck, when we're anxious, we get very stuck in our thoughts. Um, thoughts can tell us that things are dangerous or that we have to avoid or that we have to be fearful when we don't really have any evidence other than our thoughts telling us that something might be very scary and might be happening um, or that we can't handle a situation because we don't want to experience anxiety and really kind of challenging those thoughts and looking at things from different perspectives can also often be extremely helpful. Um, and, you know, then when I think about, you know, difficulty sleeping, um, relaxation then does have its place in that kind of menu of options. I don't mention relaxation first because there is very much, um, I don't know if a push is the right word or a feeling in the field of this idea of like kind of embracing our anxiety and moving into our anxiety. And I often talk with people I work with about the idea that life is kind of an exposure. You know, we're always kind of met with things that can be challenging. And we don't need to wait for anxiety to come down. We sometimes need to kind of push through it despite the anxiety that we feel. So I kind of reserve relaxation for times when we're maybe really escalated or we wanna to go to sleep or we really need to kind of wind down. Um, and all of these types of skills that I was talking about can actually be found in the MindShift app. I don't know, Kathleen, if you wanted to spotlight that a little bit, but it's a wonderful place that really all of these kinds of tools exist. So I don't know if you might wanna kind of highlight that for people. Yes, yes, for sure, thank you. Yeah, we have um, our MindShift CBT app. It's a free evidence-based anxiety tool for anxiety relief. And there's different tools to tackle worry, panic, perfectionism, social anxiety, phobias, lots of the things that we discussed today. Um, there's lots of CBT-based tools in there, thought journals, you can make your own coping cards. Um, and there's different ways to challenge yourself. Like Dr. Tobeshift is talking about, you can do things called belief experiments in the app. So kind of learning how to set up an experiment to test out the beliefs that fuel anxiety. Uh, we even have a chill zone in there where you can listen to audio recordings of guided meditation and mindfulness meditations to help you get in that mindful headspace. Uh, sometimes it can be, again, not knowing where to go from mindfulness. Um, it's nice to have everything in one place in the app. Um, and you can set your own goals and track your healthy habits in there as well. So you can download that on the App Store or in Google Play Store, I guess it's called. I'm an iOS user, but yeah, thanks for shouting out the app. It's definitely something people 
should take a look at if they're curious. It about is. Community. It's great. And it has like, I think there's a self-directed component to it. I mm -hmm. think if you're working with um, a mental health care professional, it's something you can also use kind of in between to do that in between session work. Um, hopefully the person you're working with is aware of it too. Um, Cause it's definitely something that I direct um, individuals I'm working with to all the time. And it really, it's just, it's on your phone. It's totally accessible. Um, and it really complements all these skills that we've been kind of, that I've been trying to highlight today. Awesome. There yeah. was one last question um, yeah. from Instagram that was, uh, what can happen if anxiety is left untreated? I don't know if mm. it's an ominous question to leave off on. <laughs> no, I'll try to make it hopeful and positive. Um, Thank you. I mean, we don't want to leave anxiety untreated. And I think the stories that were shared, um, today, especially kind of sharing with us um, that idea of having anxiety when young, and then the evolution of it over time. And then, um, you know, what would have happened if my younger self kind of had been more aware, right? Um, or maybe if someone had interjected at a different kind of phase in my life. Um, so we don't want to leave it untreated. Um, and I say that because it can um, grow. Um, sometimes anxiety is pretty sneaky and it can get a little bit more convoluted with time. It can kind of up the ante, I think, in terms of where it, Kind of latches on to anxiety tends to latch on to areas of our life that are a value test and i think it can kind of spread a little bit um so we don't want necessarily to leave it untreated because it can kind of continually convince ourselves that it's doing the right thing mm -hmm. and that by giving into our anxiety we are protecting ourselves we're protecting other people around us we're kind of dodging bullets all over the place um and then we're not really living a life that's worth living. So I think that's something that's very important. Um, and I think that, you know, we really want to be able to think about kind of early intervention. And as we talked about to take this, I think, to a more hopeful note is anxiety is becoming more and more recognized. The pandemic, and I am not a silver lining pandemic person, so I just can't <laughs> <laughs> maybe in maybe in 10 years, I don't know, but I can't go there right now too soon. Um, but I do think the pandemic brought anxiety more to the forefront and people started talking about it more. And there was a recognition that, I mean, it, it blew up in terms of people's mental health issues and the outreach for mental health has far exceeded the resources that we have. Um, we've certainly experienced that in Ontario and I do a little bit of work in BC too, but the wait lists at one point were just unbelievable. Um, so we think about early intervention and the more and more people that kind of listen in um, on things like we're doing today and the more and more information that we're able to disseminate through places like Anxiety Canada, I really think can allow people to feel not alone in their experiences um, and to allow people to feel that I can reach out, you know, there is help there. Um, and that is really the first step in terms of getting better, in terms of that road to wellness and recovery. Um, and it really makes it look less daunting um, when there are people like all of you um, sharing your stories and being able to talk about it in a way that feels like anything else you might talk about, right? And I think that is so important and gives people that kind of courage um, like all of you today and that bravery to be able to share things um, and take the next step in terms of getting better. So I'm hoping that's help, helpful and hopeful in terms of what people can do um, to get better. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you so much for answering those questions. And before we wrap up, I want to know, did anyone think of any last lingering questions? It's okay if not, but I'll give you a sec. I did have one question. Um, I know that it, it's re regarding the relationship between physical health and mental health. I know that there's, um, I guess you could say it's more known the impacts of physical health on mental health, but I kind of wanted to hear your take on how mental health can affect your physical health as well. Especially, this has been on my mind during the pandemic, especially, and I thought that it would be something 
interesting to talk about to hear people's take on it. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, and because mental health was so impacted um, during, like during, as you're mentioning, during the pandemic, you know, I think a lot about anxiety for sure, but my first thought, to be honest, went a little bit to depression, um, only because I think so much about how when people are significantly depressed, um, that kind of motivation and drive to engage in physical health really goes out the window. Um, so when we think about the pandemic and the impact on people's mood, feeling isolated, um, feeling down, um, higher rates for sure of like low mood and depression, um, physical health really took a toll too. And then I think of really a bi-directional relationship, right? So if we think about the impact of like how our kind of low motivation, low mood can impact us to not engage much in physical health, not get the exercise we need, stay here, then there is, you know, if you could draw it out, but kind of bi-directional relationship because it feeds back that lack of engagement, lack of physical exercise, um, not feeling well, somatic symptoms can definitely develop as a result, right? Um, and we also know, you know, from kind of impacts of mental health, there are kind of somatic um, um, issues that people can experience as well. Um, not that they're not uh, driven by organic reasons, but we know that, you know, certain physical ailments can be really heightened by uh, mental health issues as well, right? And chronic pain can be heightened by mental health issues. Um, irritable bowel syndrome is a very good example of something that has a very strong connection to um, health and wellness and stress. And, and more and more, you know, a, a lifetime ago, I worked in um, at the Toronto Western Hospital here in Ontario, and I was working with individuals who are undergoing um, bariatric surgery, which is an intervention that we use um, for people who are experiencing um, what we refer to medically as um, morbid obesity. And it's a surgical intervention to um, allow for weight loss and um, different lifestyle interventions. So at that time, when I was in that field, there was also a lot of discussion between um, gut health and brain health and a very interesting relationship that people were understanding that we're developing then too. Like, what does it mean when we change our gut health through surgical interventions, through other things? And how does that kind of feedback on the brain and hormones? And so I think there's more and more that's being discovered in terms of all of those connections. So I think it's a very important area um, of psychosocial wellness for sure. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if others have anything to add or, but yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, thank you, Alita, for asking that question. And I wanted to say thank you everyone for being here today uh, and for supporting both Action Anxiety Day and Anxiety Canada. It means so much to us that you're volunteering your time to share your story, to be open and vulnerable. Um, you're all volunteers. This is all out of your own time. Your volunteers and in Dan's case, donors, because you donate your proceeds of your artwork to us, which is amazing. Um, you've all helped shout out our services and everything that we do and offer. And like Dr. Tobeshift said, conversations like these, we're destigmatizing mental illness. We're talking about it in a casual way. And you never know who we could be helping today by sharing our stories. Was there anything that anyone wanted to plug or any links that they wanted to shout out before we go? Dan, did you have anything you wanted us to shout out? Yeah, so um, you guys have put up a great little system for individuals to have sort of crowd fundraising. Uh, I have set up my own page for this. So if anybody wants to head over to my page, uh, take a look, take a read of the bio and see if you're uh, willing to contribute, that'd be awesome. And anyone who wants to check out our fundraising site, it's fundraise.anxietycanada.com. You can set up your own personal or team challenge. And you can learn other ways that you can give to the cause on our website, other ways you can donate or get involved on social media. So thanks so much again, everyone, for being here and so much to us. Thank you on behalf of the entire Anxiety Canada team. We appreciate you. And hopefully we can do something like this again sometimes. This is really fun. <laughs>